welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. My name is Jeannie Hoffman. I'm a clinical psychologist and professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Susan Ott. She's an endocrinologist and professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington. She's presenting tonight on osteoporosis and bone health after spinal cord injury. I'll let you go from there, Dr. Ott. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thanks very much. And um, today I'm going to be talking about osteoporosis in people with spinal cord injuries. And I have no conflicts of interest. And the way I organized this talk was to answer some of the questions that you guys had raised at one of your meetings. And so um, I'm going to start off right here. So there were a lot of questions that had to do with bone density and monitoring. How soon should a person start monitoring? When should they get a bone density? How frequently should they get them? Are there other questions that should be asked? So I will answer that with um, a slide of bone density in the hips or legs of spinal cord injured patients. And this slide is just the summary of um, all of those studies and uh, there's a lot of differences because of the way they did them. Sometimes they were only looking at people who had been injured a long time ago. Some were very shortly after the injury. And, but, but the overall impression you get is that the percentage of normal is running around 30%. So that's quite a bit of bone loss. Now this one answers the question about when, because this shows the bone density in a group of spinal cord injured people um, right after the injury for the next uh, duration. And you can see here that during the first year, especially at the femoral neck, which is part of your hip, that there's already quite a bit of a loss. And it does tend to lose more at the beginning and then stabilizes out a little bit in this study. Um, the femoral shaft was a little bit more steady, but the tibia, that's the, the one in the lower leg, is the one where you're really seeing the problem, and you see it right away. So I actually think it's helpful to get the bone density early, if you can, you know, after three or four months, just to get a baseline and then another one in another uh, six to 12 months just to continue following it up. Um, now, the, the bone density places that we measure are the spine, the hip, and we can measure the arm. And a lot of times I recommend measuring the arm because if you just have an injury where it's lower than, you know, than the waist and you still have arm function, we can then rule out if the, if the arm is normal, that means we don't have to wonder if there's some other process going on like a hormonal or nutritional or all the other things that can lead to osteoporosis um, because the arm would still be okay. And I, I think a lot of doctors realize that. But I have to say one important thing about the arm is that we often report what we call a T-score. And that does not mean the same as the T-score at the hip. So I run into this trouble all the time. Um, and, and it gets worse and worse the older you are. So when you're 20 years old, the T-score is how many standard deviations you are from an average person. And that's going to be the same um, as the Z-score, which is how many you are from the person who's the same age as you. But by the time you get to be 80, these numbers are one whole unit apart. And so somebody who is 80 uh, will normally have a T-score of minus as you can see right here. Normally, at the hip, it'll be minus 2. But here at the arm, it'll be minus 3. So, so what you have to look at in, in you, you guys is what we call the z-score. That means how far are you from, how, you know, from the other people the same age as you. And um, if you remember that, what you really need is the z-score. Then you won't get you know, th these terribly scary numbers that actually are OK. And I have to say that even a lot of doctors who think they're specialists in bone disease haven't paid attention to this fact. So 
um, you might have to tell them. Okay, here's, here's another one looking, um, a long-term one. This was a long-term study. Um, I mean, well, the patients had been uh, having a spinal cord anywhere from um, zero to 30 years. And you can see that the place that really showed the early loss was at the epiphysis. That's at the knee. Um, and you lose a lot right away. And then you do keep losing some for the rest of the time. So that makes sense because it's a different kind of bone and it's lower down. And the lower down it is, the more you lose weight there. So for bone density, like I say, I'd get it early, um, monitor it probably at least every year for a while. And after a while, it depends on how it's doing. And you can, you can start waiting a little bit longer in between. Um, the other tests that we can measure um, are in the urine. And I'm going to get back to this a little bit. The urine calcium should be checked. And a lot of times it's, igno it's ignored or neglected until it's too late to do something about it. And there's a series of tests that we call markers of bone, whether you're losing bone or not. You can actually measure it in the urine. And they have different names. The one on this slide is called pyridinolin. And then we have another one that I use mostly called NTX. And there's another one that can be measured called CTX. And those can be helpful to uh, see how quickly you're losing. And for example, you can see in this slide, in the first, you know, the first few years after the injury, these numbers are very high because those are the people who are losing it very fast. And then it starts coming down again after a long time. It, it's still a little higher than we would like, but it's not as bad. And we can use this to see how, how bad things are currently and if we're giving a medicine to see if the medicine is helping. Okay. And I'm just mentioning about the fractures, which, uh, of course, that's what our whole goal is to try to prevent the fractures. And those do start to go up. Um, this, I lined up these different studies according to how long it was after the injury. And um, three or four percent at first, but um, as time went on, we got up to about a third of patients that were having uh, fractures after their injury. So this is what we would consider a high risk. OK. So the next question was, how does osteoporosis um, differ from the general population for people with SCI? And that, that question, in some ways, is really pretty easy. It's mostly the distribution of where you've lost it. So in osteoporosis, you lose bone everywhere. But in spinal cord injury, you lose it in what we call the sublesional skeletal areas. So if you're paraplegic, you're going to lose it in the legs. Your arms are going to be fine. In fact, your arms are probably going to be a little better than the average person if you're using your wheelchairs. Um, but if you, if you have a very high lesion in, in, the, you know, in the cervical spine, then you're going to have lost everywhere, but you're still not going to lose it from your head. Um, so that's the main reason that they're different. The other way is reason is that um, uh, SCI patients have a 23-fold higher risk of getting femur fractures, whereas the upper limb fractures are lower than controls. And that, again, goes along with which ones are, are having weight bearing and which ones the muscles are still working. Another difference between ordinary osteoporosis and spinal cord injury has to do with calcium and a parathyroid, which is the hormone that controls your calcium. And so in osteoporosis, these are normal. But in spinal cord injury, the calcium in your blood is increased, and so is the urine calcium. And this makes the parathyroid hormone go very low, and nephrolithiasis is common. Now, nephrolithiasis means that you're getting kidney stones. And so these are something we definitely want to prevent. And I'll come back to that, because I think there's another question. Um, I also put this slide up, because osteoporosis in general is actually not all that simple. And there's a lot of reasons why you can have osteoporosis. And you can have two, three, four of these reasons. 
And just because you've had a spinal cord injury doesn't mean you're immune from getting any of these other things. So you might also have renal disease or lung disease. You, you might have uh, lupus or rheumatoid disease. So um, when somebody has low bone, we need to think about all these other things. That harks back to why it might be helpful to, to measure the arm, because if the arm is just fine, then I don't need to worry about all those other things. OK, so here we are. Why does the body dump a lot of calcium after a spinal cord injury? And well, the main reason is that you're, you know, most of the calcium in our body is in the bone. 99% is in the bone. And you're dissolving the bone because of the injury. And so it just dissolves away, and it goes into the blood. And um, that is particularly true right after the injury, because it's so sudden, you're just dissolving it all at once. So talking about calcium, is calcium a sacred cow? Um, a lot of times when somebody hears they have osteoporosis, whether they're just an older person or whether they have spinal cord or any other thing, you know, the first thing they'll do is reach for the calcium pills. And that's been brained into us. But the recommendations have actually changed for the general population as well as for people who have osteoporosis or people with spinal cord injury, that it's better to get calcium from food than it is to get it from uh, pills. So here, here's a graph of the calcium levels after, right after the injury. And the calcium in the blood can get high, uh, sometimes very high. But it doesn't necessarily because your kidneys are going to get rid of it. So the calcium goes through the blood to the kidney, and the kidney gets rid of it. I, I think of it as a, a bathtub where you've got a faucet and a drain. So if you, if you turn the faucet on more, but you have a smart drain that opens up, then the water level will stay the same. And that's the calcium in the blood. But the problem is that you get kidney stones. And so when we look at the middle piece, all of the people in this one study had calcium in the urine that was a lot higher than the normal range that's shaded down here. And again, if you collect, we often ask for a collection all day long to see how much calcium we're dealing with. And it can be very high, especially in the beginning. So we then would not recommend eating more calcium. That's the last thing you need. So you don't have to actively restrict it. You certainly shouldn't take any pills. And you might be careful about not eating way too much in the beginning. But as the calcium comes down, we can try to make it come down with some of our medicine. Um, then you're going to want to start getting some calcium in your food. So I showed you a slide again. Um, and I'm showing it again in this context. So again, the urine calcium can be very high. But once it gets down into this, this range, you know, five to 10 years later, there's still a lot of variability. So even if you've had your injury a long time ago, if it hasn't been checked and followed, I'm going to want to know what's the calcium in the urine so I can give a more uh, tailored answer about how much calcium you should eat. And if it's greater than 300, that's the kind of the cutoff when you get out of risk for getting kidney stones. Then we would want to do something about that. And if it's lower than 300, then we say, go ahead and get the calcium from your food. And the recommended dose, and this is the dose for the general population, is 1,000 milligrams a day from food. And these are just an example of some of the kind of foods that have calcium. Um, I'm particularly fond of yogurt right now, because it also has some, some very interesting bacteria that are good for your bone. Um, and it has protein, which, of course, you also need. But any of the vegetables, the dairy, the tofu, kale, um, have calcium. And I mentioned spinach. A lot of people think spinach has calcium. Well, it, it does, but it doesn't get in. So if you eat spinach, the calcium it goes right through uh, and comes out the other end. So you can eat it, but don't count it for calcium. OK, I loved this question. Do people in dark, cloudy places like the Pacific Northwest have higher rates of osteoporosis? And should people take vitamin D or calcium supplements? Well, I already answered the, the calcium part. The vitamin D part, I think, yes. And 
I don't think there's actually more osteoporosis in the Northwest, but we do have more people with low vitamin D levels. And so here we have vitamin D. Now, there's been a fad about vitamin D for quite a long time, and so I have to bring this up because a lot of people are getting caught in this fad. So vitamin D is not a nutrient. It's a hormone. And when you look at the structure of vitamin D, here's vitamin D. It's officially named cholecalciferol. Here's cortisone. Here's estrogen. You notice that they all have these things that look like chicken wire? So if it looks like chicken wire, it's probably a hormone. And hormones have various properties. The body can make it without anything in the diet. In the case of vitamin D, your body makes it naturally from the sun and your skin. So you don't need to eat it like a food. The levels are regulated. Your skin actually regulates how much vitamin D it makes when it does get the sun. Um, there's receptors in different kinds of cells and this is important. It's harmful to be too high or too low. So we hear all the time about how people in the Northwest are too low. But there's not very many people saying, but don't take so much of it that you get too high. But this is important. This is important for you guys who have spinal cord injuries. Because what's the problem with getting too much? You put more calcium in the urine. It's the last thing you need. And so even in people who don't have any injuries at all, ordinary people who get too much, they, their risk of kidney stones starts going up. So how much should you take? Well, the official recommendation is between six and 800. Um, but most of the pills you buy in the store are 1,000, and that's perfectly safe. So 1,000 units a day that we can recommend for the entire population, including anybody with spinal cord injury. But I wouldn't take any more than that. Um, in order to get a blood level of between 20 and 50. And as I mentioned, higher levels cause not only kidney stones, kidney failure, bone fractures, and overall increase in mortality. And there have been three studies now in older women with osteoporosis where they gave high doses of vitamin D, and they had more hip fractures than the ones who got a placebo. So it goes both ways. Now, this is leading to another thing I have to talk about. This is something that's, unfortunately, money seems to get in the way of a lot of things. And vitamin D supplement has what they call shadowy money behind it. This was an article in the New York Times that explained something that I haven't been able to figure out. Why do the labs keep saying that the level should be 30 to 100 when the scientific literature says it only should be 20 to 50? Well, so they can make more money. Because there's so many people who are between 20 and 30, which are normal, and they're told they're low. So then they take some vitamin D, and then their doctor checks it again to make sure it's OK. And, maybe, and your body fights back and tries to regulate it. So it might go from 23 to 29, which are both normal, but it still says it's low. So then you get it again, and you get another test. So back when they did. Uh, uh, one survey in about five years ago, they were getting $365 million just on this test. And the really disgusting thing is that the chairman of the Endocrine Society Guideline Committee, who's named Dr. Michael Hollick, that's what this article was about, is getting paid thousands of dollars every month to continually say that the level should be greater than 30 in spite of all the evidence. And a lot of people, they pay attention to these guidelines. They don't know that he's getting a lot of money in the bank for it. Um, so I'm telling you. And here's just a little bit more information. Um, some smart investigators who lived in Wisconsin got a grant to uh, measure vitamin D in Hawaii. And, uh, they went in the wintertime, right, from Wisconsin. And so they measured um, about 93. Um, young people who were on the beach who were coming to this skate shop, and they were skateboarders, and their average age was 24. And they even looked at their skin to be sure they, they weren't using sunscreen very much, just enough to get a tan. So these were really healthy guys. And that's, here's the range of vitamin D. Half of the 
24, whoops, half of the 24-year-old healthy surfers were lower than 30, between 20 and 30. And if it's good enough for a 24-year-old surfer, it's good enough for all the rest of us. So when you get your, your lab value back from LabCorp or Quest, and it's got a big red low on it, and you're 25 or 21, it's fine. Now, if you've got your labs at the University of Washington, you, our lab has had the correct values all along. Our lab has always said 20 to 50. And from our lab, it would have said your vitamin D was normal. But you know, a lot of the other hospitals around here use LabCorp and Quest. And I don't know how you can force them to give the right units. I'm, I'm worried about the ones that are 50 to 100 as well. Because those people are at risk, and, they, and now they're coming back normal when they're not. So I keep thinking somebody is going to come in and say, no, you've got to say what the right numbers are. But in the meantime, tell all your friends, OK? All right, next question. Do standing frames, passive standing position, prevent osteoporosis? Can using vibration prevent osteoporosis? And just the kind of picture, well, this actually gets a little bit out of my area of expertise, because it's really the rehab doctors who know these machines and equipment. But I was very fortunate. There is a very nice article that was just published, like this month, <laughs> in this journal. So I'm going to keep that up just a minute, because this was a, I thought, excellent review. And I'm going to go through some of their tables of osteoporosis after the spinal cord injury. So I'm going, oh, wow, this is going to make my talk really easy. So um, you know, I'll leave it up enough time now that you guys can go. If you want to, you can get it from a medical library. OK, so the first table is there, there's this uh, two pages. So this is page one of the summary of FES and how it, um, how it helped with the bones. And it's pretty complicated, so I'm just going to show you that I, I highlighted in green the studies that were positive. Um, the authors actually put a level of evidence about the studies, and they all were rated either poor or fair. Um, a lot of these are kind of small studies. Um, a few of them looked beneficial. Others didn't look very helpful. And so these were the earliest ones from 88 to 2006. And then this is page two. This was from 2006 to 2016. And we're seeing a little bit more in the way of positive studies here that I highlighted in green, where what they were looking at is, the, did the bone density go up? Um, none of the studies were big enough, had enough uh, patients to see if the fracture rates got better, which is the most important thing. But it helps if the bone density is going up. So, I think the answer to this is um, maybe it helps. And it maybe depends on things. And we, we do still need to continually have more research in this area. Um, this is one of the studies that was considered one of the better studies. And um, they used FES. And they did the bone density in three different places, as you can see here. This part was the um, up at the hip. And you could see the ones who used the um, FES are the black line. So they did not lose as much as the ones who um, were the controls. But then when they measured it lower down, so here's in the tibia, it, it didn't uh, help as much. And when you went down even further, down into the lower part of the tibia, it didn't help at all. So it seems to help in some places, but not as you go further down. And you know we need to still get more um, information about this. They did an example of one of their uh, best patients. Uh, I love the way they say it. They, they just say like a typical patient. Um, this is a special kind of test where the, um, the structure of the bone you can see here is in yellow and orange. And this was the control, and this was the exercising in FES. And you, know, you can see that this patient actually really had a pretty nice response. So there, it can help. And I think we just need to figure out how to make it help for more people 
and you know other things that we can do to make this um, work. Um, this was a, a, um, another table of studies that used non-FES, but just uh, standing and standing frames. And they, overall, there weren't as many positive studies. Most of the studies didn't really show that much benefit. So it, it was kind of looking like the FES was really helping more than just the standing part. And this was one where they were doing uh, treadmill gait training, body weight supported treadmill, a variety of different things. Um, uh, some vibration studies here. And none of these were, were very positive. So the vibration isn't seeming to pan out very well. OK, what are the various types of pharmacological treatments? So here's one more table where they, they um, listed the studies that had been done in um, spinal cord injured patients with medications. And these are, except for the bottom one, these are all a group of drugs that we call bisphosphonates. Um, and some of them were pills, some of them were IVs. And these studies, on, on average, are showing an improvement in the bone density. And there's a little bit, there's another, another way of looking at it. But in, in this study, it really seemed that especially the newer ones were having the best results. There's one at the very bottom called denosumab. That's the one that's called Prolia that is advertised on TV all over the place now. And I don't recommend that one um, because if you happen to skip a dose, then you can have really devastating fractures afterwards. So I don't use it in my clinic anymore, even though it's still advertised on TV. OK, so this is a, a way of looking at all these studies combined together and using bisphosphonates. And so what these, every single study, they have a little dot here of how much better the medicine was in terms of bone density compared to the placebo group. And when you add them all together, you get this black diamond. And you can see that, on average, this is the percentage. It's, it's about 10% more bone density. And most of this is because the control group was losing so much. So actually, when you look at the numbers here, even though there was this big benefit, you were still losing. So the people who got the medicine were losing 3%. One lost as much as 8%. But the ones who didn't get it were losing 16 to 20%. So it really helps, but it doesn't really completely solve the problem yet. And that was in the total hip. At the distal, further down, it wasn't quite so much of a benefit, but it still leaned towards being better. And when you looked at the spine, um, it was uh, definitely better at the spine. And there's just been a Three studies where they t tried combining um, physical things with medical things. And there was one with, with a parathyroid, and it, it showed no change in the bone density. Um, there's one that looked at uh, FES with the um, bisphosphonate, and you got, um, you got a, better, uh, a better bone than when you used either one alone. So that might be a good combination. And there, there was one I'm going to show you called teriparatide. That's one where you give a shot yourself every day that tries to help build bone um, and, and vibration. So I'll show you the actual study. Um, so it's a little bit of a complicated study. Uh, what they did is, at the beginning, they had 61 people who had spinal cord injury. And they, they put them into three groups. The one group got the teriparatide alone. The second group got vibration alone, and the third group got both together. And so they did that for the first year. And you can see here they measured the spine, the hip, and a, one part of the hip that we call the femoral neck. So let's look at these top two. At the spine, the, the medicine showed a nice response, which we always see in our osteoporosis patients as well. The spine's where you really see the best result. Interestingly, let's see, if we look here at this dashed line, this was the vibration alone. It didn't do much. 
And if you added them together, you were somewhat in between. So it's almost like the vibration was making the result worse than if you just gave the medicine by itself. And then the second year, they, everybody um, who wanted to continue was given the medicine and they kind of stopped doing the vibration. And so this group of squares, um, first two years, they, they got the teriparatide the entire time. And they showed this overall a really significant benefit. The second group um, got the vibration the first year and the medicine the second year. So they showed the same nice responses as these guys did the first year. And the vibration turned out really not, not to be very helpful in this situation. OK. Several people have been told that their treatments can only be used a limited duration, um, five years. Why do certain treatments have a limited duration? So the treatments that we're talking about now are the bisphosphonates. And the reason is that the bone can become brittle. And what the drugs do is they stop you from dissolving bone. And of course, that sounds like it's good. But you have to pay a little bit of a price for that. If you can't dissolve your bone, then you don't ever um, get rid of little cracks that can develop in the bone, and you can't continually repair your bone. And the mineral can, can come into the bone, and it doesn't uh, get out as much. So if you look at this dinosaur bone, uh, if the bone gets buried in the earth, the minerals from the soil will seep into the bone. And that's actually kind of the same process that's happening when you give drugs like uh, Lendronate, Bosmax, the bisphosphonates. And it makes the bones break in a different way. And this is actually an example. This log is from the Petrified Forest National Park. And when I saw that log, I said, look at that fracture. I mean, that looks just like the way the femur fractures when people are taking bisphosphonates. So I found a picture of an ordinary. This is a log that's still, you know, it's not that old. You can still got a little bark on it. Look at how it fractures. It splinters. It's, it's still got a lot of, of uh, water in it. It doesn't have that. It's not that brittle. And if you tried to break it, it would bend a little bit before it broke. So remember the way these guys look. So one study, now we're not talking about spinal cord injury anymore. I'm just talking about ordinary people who got these drugs um, for 1 to 17 years. And they showed that the strength went up at first, but then it peaked and started coming down if you kept giving it. And that little cracks were seen, and they kept accumulating. So here's the number of cracks. It just went up all 17 years. And so what happens is eventually the number of cracks starts to make the bone weaker. So we, we avoid that by stopping the drugs after five years. That's what the cracks look like under the microscope. You see these little, where the arrows are? And they don't look like much, but you start getting a lot of them, and the bone loses its strength. And um, here's just a slide showing the, the data, the actual numbers of cracks as it goes up and up as you stay on the drug. And this is the kind of fracture you get. So just remember those logs? So this one is the, it, just a clean break. It's very sharp, transverse. And um, this one it, is an ordinary osteoporosis, and it's all splintered like this. So we want to prevent these fractures. Here's another one, just a sharp. This patient had been taking bisphosphonates. And, you get this little bump here, and you get this very sharp fracture. And the rate of those unusual fractures goes up, as you can see with duration. So from none up to about four or five years, they're really pretty low risk. But you can see it starts really going up after eight to 10 years. So that's why we don't want to give those drugs more than five years. Another example of the same thing. Um, it's possible that even ordinary fractures get worse. Um, and this was a study of uh, women, just ordinary women in the Women's Health Initiative. And uh, 5,000 had used bisphosphonates for two or more years. And if we looked at the uh, rate of fractures 
between years two and six, they were about the same. But at 10 years, the fracture rate was, was going up. It was 30% more than it was at two years. And uh, importantly, the investigators who were from here, actually, uh, University of Washington, um, they adjusted for age. So that's not, that's not because they were getting older. It's because they were taking these drugs longer. So um, since we're recommending the bisphosphonates in quite a few of the spinal cord injured patients, I say that it's a good idea to take them, but it's also not a good idea to take them longer than five years. Um, and I had mentioned before that I don't like to know some ab. And why is that? Well, it does increase the bone density. It does reduce fractures. It does stop resorption and formation. It, it causes the same kind of unusual fractures that the bisphosphonates do. So you don't get out of that problem. But the reason it's bad is what we call a rebound loss after it wears off in six months. So this was one of the earliest groups of patients that took the drug. And the red line are people who took the medicine from the beginning. And they kept taking it for 10 years. And here's the bone density. It looks very nice. It goes up, up, up for 10 years at the back. And it goes up and then kind of flattens out at the hip. And the blue line. Um, didn't take any drugs the first three years, but then they started here. So instead of 10 years, now they're at seven years. It's the only difference. And so then the study ended. And they looked six months later, and they got this rapid loss. So if we look here, actually, they had gained 8%. But a half a year later, they were now 6% lower than they, they were when they started. So they lost 14% in six months. And during that really, really rapid bone loss, they're, they're liable to get fractures. It's just another slide showing the same thing, a different group of people losing 8 and 6% after they stop. Um, even when we give zoledronate, it doesn't stop them from losing. So they took it right here. They tried to treat it to prevent it from losing. And you're still losing. You end up lower than you started. And this, was, this is what I'm worried about. Um, we've seen this several times in our clinic now. Uh, fortunately not. Other doctors have, have done this. And, and then they get all these fractures and can't figure out why their patient is doing so bad. So they, they send them here to the U. And, and um, this would be one of them. Um, this is what, when she's taking the medicine. And, and then within a few months after the discontinuation, she's got one, two, three, four, five fractures. Here's another one um, before and after. She just skipped one dose. And, and you, they often have five or six fractures. So I think this is dangerous enough that it's, um, it's something that you don't want to um, start taking. Because if you start taking it, there's no way you can stop. So you have to just take it every six months forever. That's what the company recommends. But if you do that, then you might start running into those same problems that we did with six, with, you know, six years of the bisphosphonates. And um, we're already seeing that. So the best thing is just not to start it in the first place. Okay. Have there been any big updates in research? So in the little bit of time that's left, I do want to to tell what I think is a really pretty exciting story. Um, this is looking at the horizon. It's not quite ready for prime time, but it's really close. OK, so it starts out, this story, with two different genetic diseases that are completely opposite of each other. One that happens in little children where they have terrible fractures. Uh, they, they, they can't grow. Their, their spines are little teeny things. And it's one of the most devastating diseases of children. And another, which is different, the bones are so thick that they pinch the nerves. And th this woman's face, facial muscles aren't working. So their, their, their faces are kind of saggy. They can't hear as well. They, they get headaches. Their hand, look at their hands. Here's another one. They're very, very thick. Look at how thick that is. Well, these, 
these two groups of genetic people have a mutation in the same protein. Okay? So depending on where it is, you have one of the worst bone densities and one of the best. Okay? Now, this is pretty interesting. Those people who have the, muta the mutation that gives you the really thick bone, they don't have any of the protein. The name of that protein is sclerostin. They don't have any protein. They have to have relatives who only have one mutation. Okay? So the ones who have the disease you had to have inherited from your mom and your dad. So you look now at their moms and dads or some of their other relatives who are the carriers. Okay, so this one study looked at the carriers. One of them had fractured his wrist um, when he fell from a tree and um, when he was in a motorcycle accident. The other 15 had no fractures and look at what they had had, things like falling from a height of three meters, that's nine feet, collision in a tree, riding a bicycle at a high speed, I mean a motorcycle at a high speed, and fall, a fall of a 200 kilogram weight on his back and he didn't break it, okay? So, so these people have dense, strong bone, but they don't have all the problems with the bone pinching the nerves or anything, and they have a life expectancy that's completely normal. And um, the only thing that's kind of a little different other than the fact that you can hardly break their bone, is that they can't swim because their bones are so dense that they have to keep on moving the whole time. Okay, so people are interested in that protein then. You know, what's this sclerostin do? How could it make such, such a low bone if you, if you have um, one mutation and so high if you have another? Okay, I'm going to just skip this because it's just kind of showing that there's a lot of uh, biochemistry that's involved that those of us who like biochemistry find fascinating, but I'm running out of time. So I'm going to skip to this one. So this is a very important study that I'm going to go through a little bit slowly. This is a study looking at some rats. And what they did here, you can see the arm, they put a force on it, not enough to break it, just to, to put, put some weight that, that would be right here in the middle. Okay. And then they did, that's what they called loading it. And then in another group, they did the opposite, which is a, they would suspend them. And they, they say that this does not bother the rats. They walk around on their forearms. And then the hind legs are unloaded. Okay, So we have a loaded bone and an unloaded bone. And let's see what's different. OK, so what, we're looking at a piece of the bone right where the load was. This side is the non-loaded bone, and this side is the loaded bone. So if you look in here, you can see the little black dots in these. Those are the cells in your bone that we call the osteocytes. And they look the same whether you load or unload. But then we do a stain for this protein called sclerostin. And in the ones that were unloaded, you can see a whole bunch of, this blows it up. See all these little brown dots? That's the stain. So all these cells are pouring out the sclerostin because they're unloaded. On the other hand, if you have a load, there's none. Okay. So, so these cells have stopped making the sclerostin. So this is a little tricky because it's a, it's a negative, negative thing. So sclerostin inhibits the both the, the growth of bone. So if you put some loading on it, you stop making an inhibitor, and then you release the bone to grow. And if you don't put any load on the bone, then you really inhibit the growth of bone. So of course, this, this would be what would happen if you had a spinal cord injury, is you make a lot of sclerostin. And then they looked at the same uh, animals, they looked to see whether they were forming new bone. So the ones who had, who had the high sclerostin levels up here were not making any bone. You can see new bone formation is, is this uh, a label of a red and, and green color. The ones where you, had the, where you loaded the bone, you were making new bone, which makes sense. That's what the bone does if you loaded it responds. And 
it, also importantly, this, the bone that they made was nice, normal bone. It was strong, very good bone, OK? So that has led to some uh, a medicine that blocks the sclerostin. And the name of that medicine is now Romozasumab. It's a very long name, so I'm going to call it Romo from now on. And you know, I'm just kind of skipping ahead a decade here from figuring out that Romo seems to be the signal between putting a load on the bone and the cells, the osteocytes feel that, OK, somebody's putting a load on us. We're going to stop making the sclerostin, or vice versa. So those cells in your bone really are the ones that, res that, that sense how you're doing it. And so we can try to fool the bone into thinking we're really loading you by, by giving a medicine that blocks the sclerostin. That's what Romo is. And this is the result of the, the um, second study. Here we go. So this was in women who were either given a placebo, teriparatide, alendronate, or Romo. Okay? And you can see it's better than anything that, that we've used so far. They did a big study of thousands, if I can't remember how many thousand, 5,000 people, whatever. Um, they did three big studies in the thousands. And this looked at what really counts is the fracture rates. And here's the fracture rates in the placebo after one year. And here's the ones in Romo. So it's really, it's really reducing the fracture rate. It was even better at two years. Um, and so it is now approved to treat severe risk um, osteoporosis. Um, the bone density goes up very nicely, both in the um, hip here. There's the Romo, and there's the controls, and in the spine. Okay. They only gave it for a year. It just seems after a year, the body develops a resistance to it. So that's where a lot of research is now. You know, how do we get the, how, how can we give it later on? But during that first year, it, it went up um, like 15%, sometimes 20%. This was, uh, I guess, a, just a different study. Oh, yeah, this was a study in men. So, so um, we've been able to prove that it works both in men and in women. You can see the blue line is the Romo group, and the black line is a placebo. And you would, you would definitely rather be in that blue line group. It didn't have very many side effects. Um, there, were, there seemed to be more heart attacks, but when the statisticians looked at it more carefully, it, it actually they concluded that it was really just chance. And if you remember those people you know, who had the 200 pounds on their back, anyway, those people never had heart disease. So if you have low levels your whole life, um, you don't have heart disease any more than anybody else. So. That's one of the reasons that we think that it might have just been a kind of a fluke. OK. So this is the last study I'm going to show you, because it's a study of um, rodents where they gave them a spinal cord injury. And so the, sh they, the way they did it is they basically did a little surgery and cut the spinal cord. And so they had one group where they didn't do anything. They just did a fake surgery. That's called sham. That's this group on the one side. The second group had the spinal cord injury. And the third group had the spinal cord injury, but they also gave them the Romo. So here we go. Um, this is just the body weight. So, it, so, so that didn't change their weight. But when we look at what happened to the bone, the, the group that had the spinal cord injury, they lost bone, like we all know. But the group who got Romo, actually, they had a spinal cord injury plus Romo, and they actually have more bone than the, the control group altogether. And they looked both in the femur and the tibia and the spine, and they saw the same, the same pattern in all three bones. And Here's just a, a piece of the bone that they took out and did a special imaging of it. And you can see the sham. That's the one where they, you know, they just were basically normal rats. Here's the ones who had the spinal cord injury. And you can see how much worse it is. 
And here's the one where they had the spinal cord injury plus the sclerostin. And uh, the bone is just there is really a lot better. So they also looked to see whether the bone was forming new bone. And in fact, it was um, the sham. Here's, here's the bone formation here. Spinal cord injury wasn't making very much bone. <laughs> And, but boy, when you gave them the antibody, you're, you're making bone all over the place. So there haven't been, as of yet, I haven't seen any um, studies just in spinal cord injured patients. But um, I'm not sure that they would be a lot different than others. So you know, time, time will tell us. But you know, this is on the horizon. I, it is available. Um, we're having a, a certain amount of trouble um, getting anybody to pay for it. So maybe in a little while we'll have even more to say about that. And um, that was the, uh, the end of the formal part of the talk. Excellent. Um, to go kind of back to the uh, vitamin D question is mm -hmm. that somebody was asking about what um, type of vitamin D and then the question, and I think you covered that in the next part already, but how does the different, um, the NG to milliliters relate to the IUs? Oh, yeah, okay. So um, you might see two different kinds, although mostly they're called vitamin D3. Now, whether D3 means that it, it's the animal form, D2 is the plant form. And they actually both work, but D3 works a little better. So that's what everybody's getting these days, and the real word for it in very tiny letters, if you look on the label, will be cholecalciferol. And 1,000 units is the same as 25 micrograms. And just in the last year or so, it's become, I've, I've noticed the label starting to shift over a little bit more. So it's, yeah, so it's 25 to 1,000. So what you want is either 1,000 units or 25 micrograms, okay? Great, thank you. Um, can you speak to biphosphonates and a vascular necrosis and also spontaneous femur fractures that we read about? Um, well, I showed you some pictures of the spontaneous femur fractures. Um, and um, that's, that's uh, exactly what we're talking about. Now, in terms of the, um, it's called osteonecrosis. It's actually a poor name. There is another disease called a vascular necrosis, um, which is where there's a problem with the blood flow to your hip, and the drugs don't do anything. They don't cause that. But they can, they can cause a problem with your teeth if you have to have uh, surgery. Like the most common is having a tooth removed, you know, pulling a tooth for an implant. Then the, the place, the socket where the tooth came out, doesn't heal very well. And it's not, it's not clear why it doesn't, but we know that in people who've taken these drugs for a long time, um, you can some, they have trouble healing um, any surgery. It doesn't cause trouble with the ordinary things like cavities or getting a root canal or anything like that. But um, you just have this period of a few months where it just doesn't heal. Mm -hmm. and, they, and you can see the bone underneath because it's, it's not healing over. So they call it necrosis, but it, no. it's, a, it's a bad term for it. But it's still a problem. And fortunately, it's a very rare problem unless you take it for too long. Okay. Great. Um, someone asked, mentioned that they had a reaction to reclast, and they were asking what time of medication reclast is, and is it the same as denosumab? No, reclast is the same as the ledronate. And it's one of the bisphosphonates. It's pretty common the day on the, on the kind that you give IV, the day after you get it, a lot of people get a reaction. Um, it's not really an allergy. But what happens is that the uh, cells that dissolve bone, are, they're, they're inhibited all at once. And um, they secrete a little protein that is interpreted by your immune system as being a virus. So what happens is that you feel like you got a virus. So you feel achy, you get a fever, and, and then it takes your system a day or two to figure out, oh, no, you, you don't really have a virus. And there's no long-term consequences from that. But some people have it a little more than others. 
And um, if you did have it and you needed to get another dose, it's always worse the first time. The second time you can get a little bit, but um, if, if you had a bad reaction the first time, we sometimes give a little prednisone just before the second one. Or Tylenol helps a lot too. Kind of prep you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you resume al al alondronate? Is that I'm mm -hmm. poorly yeah. pronouncing that. Um, after a pause, like can you take it for a while, then stop, and then take it again? Um, well, that's actually a question that we don't have the exact answer to. But if you take it for five years, it sticks in your bone, and it's it's going to stay in your bone what we call for the ne 10 years later, half of it's still in your bone. Mm -hmm. So if you take it for five years, then the next five years, it's still in your bone and it's still working. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really need to take anything else. Now, after that, if you could take a little bit more, we don't know for sure. And that's when I use those tests to tell if the bone is starting to dissolve more. And if those tests are going up and we think maybe, you know, you think maybe we can, but um, I wish we had more information. Yeah. More, more research to be done. There's always more research yeah. to be done. Is there any intersection of um, heterotroph heterotrophic ossification and osteoporosis treatment? Um, not that directly. Uh, the heterotopic is, is reaction kind of to the injury. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you get some cells that get, you know, they get out of place and then there's growth factors in the blood and so then they start growing where, in the muscle where they shouldn't have been in the first place. But it's not really related very much to our, our drugs that we use to treat. Mm -hmm. So kind of different problems in different, different problems, yeah. Okay. Um, somebody's asking about um, side effects of Romo. You mentioned that you didn't, there weren't really many, but any sp particular ones that people notice more than others? Well, it, it, um, it's an injection, and so just like every other injection, sometimes it's a little sore where it got injected. Okay. And uh, that's, I think, I, I've read that a few people got rashes. Mm -hmm. it's, but it's been pretty uh, free of side effects compared to a lot of drugs. And is it a daily injection like one Monthly. of the other ones? Monthly injection. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of your patients um, mentioned that uh, is taking hydrochlorothiazide um, right. and that their understanding is that it helps hit the bones retain calcium. How does that fit into kind of so treatments? It, it's true, it does, but it's mild. So um, it has to do with acid base. So, so the, the thiazides actually make you a little bit more alkalotic. And, and the bones need acid to dissolve. I mean, the, the osteoclasts need acid to dissolve the bone. So um, if you make them a little less acidic, they can't do it. But the main reason we use it is that it helps with the calcium in the urine. And so it will work on your kidney to keep the calcium inside your body instead of spilling out into your urine and causing kidney stones. OK? Interesting. But if you look, if you look at, it's usually used for blood pressure. Right. If you look at, just across the board, people in the country who take thiazides, um, compared to people who don't, they have 10% fewer hip fractures. So they do have, you know, it's not really a strong drug, but it is a beneficial weak drug. I like that, a yeah. beneficial weak drug. Uh -huh. um, so. Uh, some women uh, go on birth control pl pills or hormone replacement that potentially helps with bone health or o prevents osteoporosis? Well, estrogen is really crucial to, to the bone in, in actually women and men. Um, in men, the testosterone turns into estrogen. In women, they need the estrogen itself. Um, and so if something's happening to make a young woman um, lose her periods, that means her estrogen is too low, then it's definitely a good idea to give it back. And it's probably best to give it, we think it's best to give it back as a patch. Um, 
And a lot of times it doesn't make all that much difference, but if, and if you're really trying to get the very most benefit out of estrogen, it's best to use. They've got a birth control patch now, mm -hmm. okay? And so anybody, any woman who's younger than 50 who's not having at least 10 periods a year would benefit from getting the estrogen back. And then after menopause, that would prevent the ordinary postmenopausal osteoporosis. So if you had, if, if you're a woman with spinal cord injury and you also going through menopause, then you'd have two things going on. And so as long as you didn't have any real reasons to, to not have it, that, that would be if you'd had like breast cancer, if you, um, if you have blood clotting, then, then you wouldn't be able to. But the estrogens that we use these days don't actually cause the breast cancer. It's a, it's a widely held belief, but it, it, was the, uh, it was the drug they always gave along with estrogen called progesterone, a particular one called um, medroxyprogesterone or Provera. That was what was causing the breast cancer, and it was all blamed on estrogen. Okay. Interesting. So you wouldn't want to take Provera ever. I think it should be off the market, personally. I think it's a carcinogen. Yeah. Okay. Um. So there's uh, somebody who is uh, 78 with a high spinal cord injury with severe osteoporosis and is wondering if they should get their physician to just prescribe a biphosphonate or whether it's contraindicated for fear it will retain old bone cells and make the shoulders a bigger mess than they already are. Well, if you haven't already had any bisphosphonate, it would... It would be, there's no age limit. We, we give it to, I actually think that the older you are, the more indication there is for it. Because if you're 78, I'm not so worried about what happens when you're 105, <laughs> okay? Um, so it's the long-term effects that we're worried about, but during the next, you know, as long as you don't take more than five years, but if you get one shot in the last two years, and maybe when you're 80, you get a shot, you might want to get one more when you're 82, and then that'd be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there um, a recommendation for different biphosphonates by age? Like, should um, should this person get a different biphosphonate? No, I, I tend to use the zledronate just because it's the most potent one, and uh, it, it's kind of our standard now. Um, the older one is pomidronate. It doesn't last quite as long. So, so, and then there's a couple of oral ones, alendronate and residronate. And residronate, for some reason, costs a lot more, so it's not worth it because they act almost the same way. So those are the ones we have. Thank you very much, Dr. Ott. That was incredibly informative and very useful information, and we very, very much appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much.